Hi, my name's Corinne Deal. I'm a solicitor at A.R. Connolly & Company. I'm here with Olivia Malian, a partner at Carol O'Day, and we're going to be speaking about self-driving vehicles. Thank you for coming in, Olivia. Not a problem. So what are self-driving vehicles? Well, I think uh, it's quite self-explanatory what a self-driving vehicle is. It's a vehicle with some level of automation, which ideally, if you get in at point A and you tell it to go to point B, it can take you there independently of you driving it. And when we say independently of you driving it, essentially it will take into consideration other vehicles on the road, pedestrians, infrastructure and say the weather. What has been the development to self-driving cars as they are today? So they didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, in the 1950s Chrysler actually developed cruise control and then after that in the 1960s the American government set up a grant for entrepreneurs and companies whereby um, they wanted them to develop self-driving vehicles until about 1985 and no one was actually successful but since then we've had um, anti-lock braking, we've had uh, lane departure controls, uh, video cameras on the back of our cars to tell us if we are reverse parking correctly and about to hit another car behind us. So we do have vehicles on the road with some level of automation, but not currently that we can actually sit in and take us from point A to point B. But it has gotten to the point where um, there are vehicles with such levels of automation that the Society of Automotive Engineers has had to develop about six levels of uh, categorisation, which oddly enough starts at zero and goes to five. And zero is absolutely no automation, and number five is completely automated, where the driver doesn't need to drive at all. And the main difference is between three and four, whereby three, um, the driver still has some control of the vehicle, and that's called conditional automation. And number four, whereby the dynamic controls of the vehicle are taken over by the system itself and not the driver. So the system would take care of changing lanes, um, parking, braking, acceleration, etc. Is the shift towards self-driving vehicles inevitable? And how will insurers or stakeholders like insurers benefit from this? Well, I think uh, considering that we all drive automated vehicles to some extent, um, it is inevitable. And there was a US study published by KPMG in 2017 that revealed a direct correlation by the increase in automation in vehicles, which led to a decrease in the number of accidents on the road. And they projected that by 2050, there would be a reduction of about 90% of accidents on the road, which would lead to about 63% uh, of a reduction in costs. So I think insurers uh, are greatly to benefit and also road users are greatly to benefit if their projections actually prove to be correct. So can we project the same outcome in Australia or in New South Wales? I think it can be anticipated that there would be a reduction in the number of accidents on the roadway if the KPMG study is to be accepted because the technology over in America and say the Asia Pacific region is quite similar if not the same but of course our uh, personal injury system in New South Wales differs from many states in America so uh, the number in terms of the reduction in costs may not be exactly the same between the USA and New South Wales. So how would you identify who's at fault then? There was an accident. Well, currently in New South Wales, under the current legislation uh, that just came in, that came through on the 1st of December 2017, which is the Motor Accidents Injuries Act, a driver is defined as somebody that is in charge of a vehicle, quote unquote. Um, so, but who is in charge of a vehicle is quite easy to determine uh, at levels, say, zero to three of an automated vehicle but between four and five, that becomes a much more complex question. Someone in a level four or five vehicle who was involved in an accident, you would assume that the system made all the decisions in terms of braking, driving, changing lanes, etc. Therefore, query whether or not the person in the vehicle is actually a passenger or a driver. And if that is the case, if our personal injury system under the uh, Motor Accident Injuries Act can actually pick up 
um, that claim or if by default that becomes a product liability claim against the manufacturer of the vehicle. The other issues are whether or not the uh, accident occurred due to vehicle to vehicle technology or vehicle to infrastructure technology. And vehicle to vehicle technology is essentially the technology within the system that they're developing that takes in data from other SDVs around the vehicle and processes it so as to avoid accidents. Then you also have vehicle to infrastructure technology which takes into account the infrastructure around the vehicle, such as roads, curbs, signage, pedestrians, etc., and processes that data so as to avoid accidents. So without knowing how that technology works, we won't actually know uh, what caused an accident and whether it was the driver, i.e. the person inside the vehicle that took control of the system, or if it was an error in interpretation by the system itself of the V2V technology or the V2I technology. So it seems like the self-driving vehicle technology is very reliant on surrounding infrastructure uh, and whether that's properly maintained. Is there a liability then for councils? Uh, yeah, there could be. I mean, I know that Ford is currently developing automated vehicles that are completely independent of V2I technology. Whether or not that's successful, I don't know. But there are issues, conceivably, where V2I technology doesn't interpret the data around it properly or due to the natural wear and tear of the surrounding infrastructure. There was an instance of an automated vehicle uh, that was being trialled on the roads uh, reading V2I technology and it was completely fine because the vehicle was actually reading the, the lane markings on the lane and staying within its lane and changing lanes properly. But of course this technology was disrupted when they found out that there was snow on the road and the vehicle stopped moving. <laughs> so um, in terms of V2I technology, yes it does present issues with normal wear and tear uh, and you really need to ask yourself what responsibility, say, councils would have in this instance if they are responsible for the upkeep of infrastructure, roads, curbs, etc., and whether or not they will be afforded the protection of, say, Section 42 of the Civil Liability Act, which um, provides them with a defence in terms of their financial resources and otherwise. So what are the current technologies in storing data, collision data, in? today's cars. Currently the cars on the road that we have, if they are newer model cars, have SRS and ACM technology which record certain information prior to a collision and that information can include whether or not the brakes were working, um, whether the car was in park mode, if the driver had their seat belt on, uh, etc. And we use what we call the Bosch Crash Data Retrieval System to actually um, take in all that information and interpret what was actually occurring just before an accident uh, happened. So not dissimilar to that, um, most SDVs will include something like a black box which will take in all that information before an accident and then we can actually siphon that out and determine what was actually occurring before the accident. So that's a lot of data that would be recorded. Are there any privacy or ethical issues to do with self-driving vehicles? The Australian National Transport Commission has identified about 716 potential issues with SDVs and they include privacy, a fraud, and um, regulatory issues. So whilst we are all mindful about the information that we provide to corporations, I think it is inevitable with SDVs that we have to relinquish some of the data, at least location tracking information. But what happens with that data is another story and there are issues as to whether or not that information can be sold off to third parties for marketing purposes. Why is this important for practitioners? I think the discussion that we've had today basically shows that the current legislation in New South Wales hasn't grappled with the upcoming technology when it comes to self-driving vehicles. At least not the Motor Accident Injuries Act or at least the Privacy Act. But we do have the benefit of looking at the US experience at the moment. They currently have about 90 self-driving vehicles on the road and that's looking to increase over the next year or so. So once they hit the mass market, we'll be able to look at the US experience and see what laws and regulations that they pass and learn from where they go wrong. I understand there's no international standards in place currently. So until there are 
final international codes or regulations in relation to it, it'll be difficult for Australia to roll out uh, self-driving vehicles into the market. So thank you very much for coming on, Olivia. It's been a great discussion. Thank you for having me, Corinne.